Well, hi everyone. It's uh, Wednesday here, and it's actually a Wednesday morning here in Australia. Um, but a, and you know, could be a different time wherever you are in the world. But a big warm welcome f uh, to you. This is another episode of Midweek Midi, and without further ado, I thought I'd say good day to the lovely people that have joined me today. And um, there, there's all of us. So uh, that includes you guys who are going to jump into the chat as well. So you've got a little window for yourself up there. But let's start um, off with. A very big warm welcome to Adam Billius. He's uh, just joined us as a special guest today. So, how are you going, Adam? I'm doing great. It Fantastic. is uh, to have rather you. warm. It's rather warm here in California. Oh, that's nice. So it's starting to warm up over there. Beautiful. It is. Fantastic. And um, what we'll do is we'll come back to you in a couple of minutes, and we can, you know, get you to tell us all about what you do and everything. But this is just a quick. A quick hello, and we'll just pop over to say good day to Andrew. Nice to have you, Andrew. How you going, everybody? It's good to be back, and uh, it's uh, hopefully a good a good week for for information this week. Be good. Yeah, should be should be exciting. So um, the topics this week we've got covering, I guess, uh, a whole bunch of stuff, um, and I think the the one that was on the graphic was this uh, laser harp DIY. Um, thing that we'll, we'll get teed up and we'll show you a little bit of video for that. Uh, we're going to look at um, some other cool things, but I think the, probably the big one is we're just about to hit May and um, this month, May coming up, is MIDI month and I think a lot of people are probably wondering, well, what is that about? So we're going to have Aidan here is going to tell us all about what that is and um, you can see he's sitting in front of that big massive MIDI 2.0 banner. So he'll, he, he's the man in the know. He'll tell us all about it. So um, we'll get to that in a sec as well. But while we're at it too, we'll say good day to our little chatties to have jumped in. Uh, we've got the Intergalactic Federation. That's a great nick. And we all know him as Dazza. He sometimes jumps into the, sh into the show. So a big warm welcome to you, Dazza. We've got Neil, we've got Wagyu and uh, Michael B. So fantastic. So it's a few people already joining. It's great to see you. Don't forget, if you are lurking, don't forget, don't be shy, jump into chat. We won't bite. And you can ask all sorts of questions. So. Um, Andrew, I'll get you to kick off uh, with a few things. I'll just tee up that video in a sec, but um, let us know where you want to start with and um, we'll go from there, I guess. Well, I, was just, I was just gonna say, maybe we should do uh, a little bit of news and then we, maybe we should just start with Mayor's MIDI month and then we can um, then jump, do a bit in reverse because uh, I, I know that Adam's a fairly busy person. So let's, let's try and make sure we can get on top of that because I think that's the best topic for us this week. Okay. Do you want to do you want to introduce it? I I do. I do. Okay. So, uh, for those who for those who don't know, Mayor's Midi Month runs has run probably for the last 3 years and Athens got to correct me on all the things that I get wrong here. Um, and it's a sort of a great way to sort of get more people involved with the midi.org website and uh, the community engagement that's around that. And each year it uh, does a couple of special events. This year is probably a bigger year because MIDI, and I've got to do this correctly, don't I? Uh, MIDI 2 is out this year. And I think it's probably, you know, we've talked about it in previous years for May is MIDI month. But now that there's actually information out there, um, hopefully we can actually get into a lot more discussions around with that. So. I'm going to jump over to Athen and then I'm probably going to ask lots of questions and uh, we can go from there. Great. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we have been doing May as Midi Month for the past three years. And in the in the past few years, what we did is we, we, um, we always ran kind of the same uh, kind of the, the, the same promotion, which was we ask people, we have now uh, on the, the MIDI Association is the community of people, uh, individuals at MIDI.org who join the free to join community of people there. So it's totally free to join. You just, you know, give us your email address and then we, we send you out a newsletter to keep you informed on what's going on with MIDI. And what we do every May is we, we ask and we now have about 23,000 people. Uh, who are um, MIDI Association members, and we send out a, a, a newsletter to them. We do four newsletters uh, during the month of May, and we ask those 23,000 people uh, to donate money, and then we have 
companies from the MMA who are sponsors and they match the the donation. So last year we were able to raise uh, about $24,000. So uh, people from the uh, members of the MIDI Association donated, you know, little bits, $5 here, $10 there. And uh, it, it made up uh, over $2,500 and sponsors match up to a certain amount. So, so we had platinum sponsors that matched up to two thousand dollars, and we had uh, gold sponsors who matched up to a thousand dollars, and silver sponsors who matched up to five hundred dollars. Last year, we used that money to improve the the services on our website. So, we we added some things, like we added a video conferencing system, very similar to this, uh, and we. You know, we did some other things to improve the way the website ran and hosting and things like that. This year, things are obviously a little bit different. Uh, so what we are doing this year is we are going to donate all the money we raise for May is Midi Month and donate it to the Grammy Foundation's COVID-19 fund. Uh, and the COVID-19 fund is specifically for musicians who've been affected you know, there are a lot of people out there. Um, I have, you know, friends who are keyboard techs uh, who are touring with major, you know, major acts. They are obviously not touring anymore. Um, so they're, you know, they're being affected by that. But there, there are also a lot of people who are musicians who are being affected by COVID-19 itself. So so we think it's a great cause. Um, we have a, a number of sponsors. I, I don't have the press release in front of me, so I'm going to try to remember them all. Uh, we have Ableton. We have Audio Modeling. Uh, we have IK Multimedia. We have Moog. We have Melodics. Uh, we have Roland. We have Steinberg. And we have uh, Yamaha. So we have a, a lot of great sponsors. And uh, what the sponsors are going to do is you know, there's a lot of companies now um, who are focused on actually giving stuff away for free. Everybody's stuck in their house. And uh, if you go to the MIDI.org website, you know, there's a notice up there that the, you know, the best and safest thing that you can do right now is stay at home and play at home. Uh, so we're focusing on some free tools, uh, you know, free downloads uh, to allow people uh, to enjoy, try to enjoy their time when they're stuck in their house. Uh, and, uh, of course there's, you know, lots of great tools that come from our uh, sponsors to help people do webinars. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of webinars. Everybody is doing, you know, kind of these video conferencing things. My wife, I don't know if you can hear it, hopefully not because I've got a pretty good microphone that doesn't pick up too far, but, uh, my wife is actually teaching in the other room and, and she has another setup with, a you know, a computer. She's got web cameras uh, and she is trying to teach five-year-old kids uh, in group lessons uh, over the internet which is amazing to watch it's it's pretty humorous because you know uh, she's trying to deal with five-year-old kids who are you know they're squirming around and they're disappearing off the, the off the screen and all of that stuff um, but you know everybody is trying to figure out how to communicate better and of course one one of the great ways to communicate and collaborate is with MIDI. So so that's what we're focused on for May is MIDI Month. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming up. That's fantastic. That's really interesting. I like um, how it's kind of to do with collaboration and you know and communication. I think that's that's to me what seems to be emerging as the big win for this year. I know we've had a lot of negatives this year with you know COVID nineteen and bushfires and all sorts of crazy things going on at the start of this year. But I think the big win this year is is collaboration, especially online, and people just, you know, getting together in some, in some sort of way. So that's really, really cool. And I think with you guys doing that, I think it's going to be uh, a brilliant way for anyone who wants to sort of learn how to get themselves involved in that. Um, they can sort of, I guess, register and become part of um, the Media Association website. Now, I just thought I'd bring that up quickly. Just if you've never seen it before, um, here it is here. This is the Media Association's website. And um, there's the graphic there for May's Media Month. And if you do want to register, you just click on the big register button up the top and yep. just, yeah. You might want to scroll, scroll down to the bottom there. You might, you guys might find a little surprise at the bottom. Uh, do, 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 do. Keep, Keep going. going. Yeah, there you are. There you go. Oh, great. We're here. Beautiful. 
<laughs> Fantastic. So I, I put I put that up the, the, uh, the, this morning. Uh, you know, one, one of the things about MIDI uh, that I always say is that MIDI is, is incredibly unique. Uh, it's an incredibly unique story because MIDI has actually been connecting not just products, but people for 37 years. Uh, you know, the people actually, they kind of, they kind of bond over MIDI. I, I, have, a, I have an expression uh, and I hope no one uh, who tunes into midweek MIDI would be offended by it, but I call myself a certified MIDI. <laughs> I, I mean, I am, I am just geeked about MIDI. I have always been geeked about MIDI. I w was fortunate enough to be around when MIDI first, you know, was introduced uh, and have been, seen it grow and change over the past 37 years. And it, it's it's an amazing uh, story of collaboration between extremely large companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, the Yamaha, Roland, Korg, and very small companies. There are lots of one-person companies uh, who are members of the MIDI Association, and those those large and those small companies get together. And the amazing thing about MIDI is really that everybody sets aside their competitiveness. Uh, you know, they, they compete on all sorts of levels, but when they start to talk about MIDI, it's all about collaboration and cooperation. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a, there was a somebody, we did a survey uh, a while back and, and, and somebody said, MIDI is a great example of when companies set aside their competitive nature to do something for the greater good. Never heard or seen anything so noble. Yeah, and it was a very beautiful statement from you know from an end user just saying how he he felt about MIDI. Yeah, I I, I actually think it's happening again too with the the 2.0. So I mean, obviously it happened back in in the 80s when you had Dave Smith and you had Roland and you know all those guys got involved. Um, and you know it was amazing. You know, I I was only a teenager when that happened, so. Um, I do remember it, and uh, I do remember sort of my first touch of MIDI was kind of mid '80s, around there probably. Um, and you know, we had uh, it coming into universities and things like that. It was actually kind of an exciting thing, and you know, it t it was actually a new technology. No one has ever seen that before. Whereas this time around, you got MIDI 2.0. It's it's now this um, really interesting sort of um, improvement where they're starting to really you know, focus on things like expression and performance and, you know, ease of connectivity and things like things that really just needed to be done. But they didn't know about that back in the 80s. They had no idea, really. And but what's happening with that now is that you've got the same thing happening again, where you've got companies who are just putting aside any differences they might have with their competitors. And they're just saying, right, we we should all get together. We should all, you know, make this a, a brilliant thing because this is going to be part of the future for a while so let's you know make a good a good go of it and i think that's that's a brilliant thing it's like we we're saying before collaboration it's it's brilliant so yeah love it absolutely brilliant yeah yeah i mean you know you have to remember the midi started out with some unbelievably simple goals it really was i want to plug a jupiter 6 into a, a sequential circuit six, 600 and you know press a note and the same note comes out on the other synthesizer and and at that time there was you know neither of those things were even velocity sensitive so it yeah. was it was MIDI, the original midi specification was 8 pages long you know, it was a very, very simple document. And and from that very simple start, the, the beauty of MIDI is it has continued to evolve and change. And, you know, you got standard MIDI files so people could share, uh, collaborate, you know, by, by sending standard MIDI files. Um, at that time, you couldn't send them over the internet because the internet didn't exist yet. Um, then you had uh, MIDI timecode, and MIDI timecode really transformed Hollywood because now MIDI timecode allowed tape machines to be synchronized to motion pictures. I mean, it sounds so rudimentary now, but 
But back then, that was quite a revolution uh, in terms of the way Hollywood uh, film scores were done. You know, then you got to the 2000s and MIDI evolves again with soft synths in the mid-2005. Mid, uh, you start getting the digital DJ coming out and people like Moldover getting into the uh, DIY, which I know you're going to be talking about DIY, some DIY products. It's one of my favorite things that I always love to cover on MIDI.org. There's tons of articles about just you know the, the somewhat crazy uses that people figure out for for MIDI. There's a there's mm. a gentleman who did a DIY project, which is it is the loudest musical instrument in the world. Uh, it is an air horn that is parked in a valley in Pennsylvania because you can't get within a quarter mile of the air horn because <laughs> because it will blow out your ears. And of course, he has to trigger it via MIDI. Oh, brilliant! And it is—it is the not only the world's loudest instrument; it is also the world's loudest MIDI-controlled instrument. <laughs> brilliant! I love it. I love it. Uh, I mean, th those DIY projects—they're they're incredible, aren't they? And seeing, you know, it's not just music that MIDI is involved in, is it? It's also—it's um, in the video world, very, very heavily in the video world now for controlling videos and. Um, and then even in automation, people use MIDI. So yeah, it's, it's brilliant how it's evolved. Absolutely. One of the actual products that I want to talk about in the future is a thing called Fermata, which is, um, I think, you know, Athan was talking about this briefly, is explosions of MIDI at various points of time. And I think in a strange way, I think uh, the... Oh, have we just lost Andrew? I think we just Andrew, lost Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew is revolting. Oh, here we go. He's back. <laughs> we'll put him back. Andrew, we just lost you oh. just as you were saying your point. So I just want to just cover that again. No, that's all right. I, I will get this internet fixed at some point. I'm, it's been bugging me. But effectively, what I was saying is I think that there's been an explosion in the DIY community since the sort of uh, the whole Arduino um uh, explosion of actual microcontrollers and I think that's been really interesting because we have a whole bunch of creativity and I think that that's really important and people are now using it for things like uh, robotics and stuff like that as well not just music but I think you know that w the ability to kind of now have it so it's it's accessible you know you don't have to it's a very simple process to get something press a few buttons on a controller and you get you know, MIDI out and away you go and you can have that hooked into where you go. And I think that that's been a really positive influence. And we're seeing people who are now moving from, I built something at home to now I can actually, you know, they're actually marketing it and becoming, you know, manufacturers and then producing that. And I think that that's been a really interesting thing over the last, yeah. sort of, you know, five to six years, really. Yeah, it's, there's definitely been a little it, boom it, with that. Yeah, and, and the number of Kickstarter, uh, you know, Indiegogo campaigns that are actually MIDI controllers. We did an article uh, a, a few months ago. You know, every year uh, at Georgia Tech, they have a competition for musical instruments, new musical instruments. And you can build anything. You can, there, some of them are acoustic instruments and some of them are, are built with electronics. This year, all three of the winter, winners of the Guthman um, Musical design contest. They were all MIDI controllers, and and you know that just is it. And they all, of course, were using MIDI 1.0, not even MIDI, using MIDI 2.0 because it, it it wasn't uh, you know uh, adopted yet. And that's just a testament to you know the the power. One of the great things about MIDI is it's very hackable. It's 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 simple enough. Uh, a lot of people get their start coding actually. Uh, by playing around with MIDI. They're musicians, they start playing around with MIDI and then they kind of get the bug and then that leads them to the next step and all of a sudden they're, they've got a copy of Max and after they got a copy of Max, they got a copy of you know, some things that are doing a little bit of DSP and all of a sudden you know, they become engineers, which is great. Definitely, definitely. I thought um, I wanted to... Yeah, go for it, Andrew. Sorry, Ethan, I wanted to actually ask you a little bit about m moving away from the, from sort of the historical sides of things, because I think, you know, um, there's a lot of information about that, and I think people can already go out there, and, and we'll probably cover a lot of that. I want to ask you a lot about where 
you see not just the future of MIDI 2 going, and I know it's sort of predicting the crystal ball, but also the MIDI Association. I think uh, one of the things that I've really noticed about the MIDI Association over the last couple of years is it's a far more inclusive environment than probably what's been not just po what's been possible in the past but also um you know with you know we now have web browsers and 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 you know there's been a, a big shift um where would you like to see the midi association be in a couple of years and also um well let's start with that question first well it's a, it's a, it's a great question you know, certainly we want to grow our membership. I mean, we started with, uh, you know, basically zero uh, uh, in 2015, really didn't get started with the website till 2016. And now we're up to, you know, 23,000. We don't spend a lot of money on advertising. It's all all basically organic Google search, which is which is great. Um, where One of the things that I'd like to see and, and some things that we've been talking about in the, in the future is... Um, I think that there's an opportunity for the uh, for more inclusion, direct inclusion of input from uh, people around the world. And there are there are a couple of things that we have done in the past that, that already exist for the MIDI Manufacturers Association. You know, the MIDI Manufacturers Association, you you pay to be a member. It's the weirdest organization in the world because you pay to do work for free, essentially. Uh, and um, it's a very democratic way of doing it. Uh, co uh, companies pay based on their revenue. So the larger companies, this is all public information, so there's no secrets there. You know, the larger companies like um, Apple and Microsoft pay $20,000 a year. Yamaha pays uh, $4,000 a year because that's the revenue bracket we're in. And and for a small company, they, they can become an MMA member for $600, and you can get a SysX ID for $240. But one of the things that we have done in the past, uh, we there is actually uh, an organization called the Interactive Audio Special Interest Group, and it was started out of the Game Developers Conference. It was started at a kind of a town hall meeting where a bunch of people who were involved with game audio and wanted more interactivity and and were you know very much using MIDI to get that interactivity. Um, they they formed a group and it's a special interest group. So they have they have their own meetings. They have their own um, uh, advisory board. They kind of decide things own, but they get together focused on a particular aspect, and then they bring recommendations to the MIDI Manufacturers Association and say, "This is what the game community needs." in terms of interactivity uh, i see the possibility for uh you know uh that that same kind of special interest group for you mentioned the you know the diy thing i think that would make perfect sense to have a you know an arduino special interest group i think it would be make sense to have a mobile app special interest group so i would like to see how we can structurally in in the organization uh, you know, that is the MIDI Manufacturers Association have an official path for people to express their opinions on, on, on specific topics. Uh, and then taking it just one step further with the, with the MIDI Manufacturers Association itself, I'm really excited um, with what's going to happen with MIDI 2.0 in some of the larger commercial markets uh, because, and games is certainly one of those things uh, you know so um, we haven't talked a lot about MIDI 2.0 but you know Andrew knows a lot about it more than me because he's he's helping develop some of the, the really cool property exchange specifications that we're working on um, but the basic thing about MIDI 2.0 is it, it makes uh, it turns MIDI into a into a from a monologue to a dialogue you know you had a you know, had a separate in and out five pin din port on on midi uh, originally and so you couldn't assume bi-directionality and in 2015 we said look let's assume bi-directionality because all modern transports are bi-directional and if we do that we can get the, the machines talking to each other and then we can do all of these different things we can have a new protocol we can have profiles we can have property exchange all of those things but for example a a profile um, for a game controller 
you know that that has that has some really exciting implications when you when you have the the you know the the broad mass of of control of game devices that are out there the xbox for example from microsoft you know their their midi driver what they do with midi is the same on their phone on their computer and on their game console and so it, it opens it out to some really, really interesting possibilities. So I see this a lot of stuff happening in the game industry. I see a lot of stuff happening in the karaoke market in Japan, which is a very bizarre thing that I happen to have been involved in, which the largest ISDN networks in the world are actually these uh, networks that are, are, are in these skyscrapers in, in Japan uh, with... Um, that are all interconnected via ISDN and actually send MIDI files down these ISDN lines. And a, a song comes out and it's launched on a TV show at nine o'clock and at 11 o'clock at night, you can go out and you can sing that new song in the karaoke bar because they're all connected uh, via ISDN. So yeah, I think there's some really exciting stuff coming down the road in, in kind of that commercial area because that's where people can invest uh, you know, they can invest in innovation because they have the money to do that. Very, very interesting. And it's also eye-opening to know that, you know, there's there's a lot going on that a lot of us musicians probably wouldn't even know about. So, um, you know, it, it may be one of those things just if you're bored one day, just go and sort of have a little poke around at the Media Association's website and the Mini Manufacturers Association. Just have a little, little look around and you never know that might spark an idea with you. Now, Andrew, I think this great segue now to let's have a look at this uh, DIY laser harp, hey? We, should we um, check this yeah, out? Sure. Because I think this really sort of gets people sort of interested in seeing what I guess is possible. Now, um, this video I've got teed up here. Um, goes for three minutes. I'm not going to show the whole video. So, Andrew, did you, is there any just from the start and just show a little bit of it, or what do you think? I yeah. think about halfway through, I think, is fine. I don't yeah. think, it's only just, it pretty much repeats itself. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we got audio. Okay, here we go. Interesting bit of hardware there. Pretty cool. I think we get the idea. Um, so <laughs> I could just see all Maybe. of the all of the joking people saying, "This is just a glorified D bean machine." <laughs> <laughs> well, it, was, it actually reminded me of the beams. Did, did uh, you're familiar with beams? I am. Yeah. Yeah. There was, yeah. 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 So it, it was very similar to that. And what was great is is is. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to insult somebody now. But but the. Uh, the 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 technology was very innovative, but the music was not. <laughs> the music was very nineties, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I think we've been there, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello, it was, it's the nineties it calling. <laughs> Brilliant. I think the part that was interesting for me is that uh, one of the things that they were doing with that is they've got uh, ultrasonic sensors, which didn't really come out in what they were showing, but that's where they were getting the sort of velocity sensitivity if you will or, or mm. sort of variance in when they're actually cutting the beam um but i think what i do like about it is it's got this whole aspect of uh live playability that you that, you know you see people and they stand behind a keyboard and they're, they're fantastic but you very rarely get to actually see what they're doing 
and so there's actually a big been a big shift with with a lot of especially in a lot of the smaller industry and and small things smaller companies who have got these kinds of very visual kinds of controllers like um the amount uh, at nam the amount of uh hand gesture controllers for midi was just phenomenal mm -hmm. it was about three or four companies small companies doing it um all of varying you know qualities and and you know different expressions but it's really interesting to actually see now that people and there's been again this is part of this big shift thing where there's this big thing where people are actually now using physical movement with MIDI and I find that that's that's what I really like about it so I don't know if you could see through the box too well in a live setup with the harp but you know it's there and look and I know that this kind of stuff's been done before I think it goes right back you know there's been quite a few people but yeah yeah it's, so it's really good seeing people do that so you gentlemen are from Australia are you familiar with Claude Woodward do you know who Claude is yes I've seen him <laughs> he yes. um, I, yeah, would, I, want yeah, to, I, <laughs> I want to get I'm, him so, at I'm, some point on the show. You should. He is, he is amazing. But, he, you know, he, he has developed yeah. a, an, uh, an amazing controller, which is Arduino-based, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Uh, and, you know, he, he, does, he does some amazing stuff. I mean, Claude has been doing, uh, you know, DIY controllers for years and years uh and we yeah. we cover him all and, the time and, whenever he comes out with a new project we cover him on on midi.org because he he is just a he is a lovely character that's all i can say how do you I how do you spell his name I'll, I'll get his website you, up look up if you if you just go to midi midi.org and type in claude woodward he you will get uh, everything you could ever want to know about claude he started off He's as a street also guns, musician. I, I think I just got his name right. Yeah. Yeah, he, he goes he, under the Sonic Manipulator. Ah, uh, got it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And he's based in Melbourne. Um, he came up here for a. Oh, there was a couple of years, many years ago. There was a, a an audio conference, and I went for some other reason, and and there he was, and I had never, I had no experience with him whatsoever before, and you know he gets up and he's got this literally this perspex, uh, how would I put describe it's a perfect perspex stage unit that he's built himself with all these levers, and and then, uh, he you know he was showing it or showing off how he was actually building it. It was fascinating. It was absolutely interesting. Um, there it is. Very, very fascinating, and he is a character. He's a great character. I mean, I mean, he used to busk in a spacesuit in Melbourne, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, this is look, it, this is that you know, if I said to Claude, Claude, you're a idiot, he would take it as a supreme compliment <laughs> because <laughs> he is just, you know, he's just he's just a character and 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 very, very creative, incredibly creative. Well, it's, it's awesome to see what people are doing. I, I really I mean, that part of it, I think, is probably where I would like this show to do more, get more people like him and whoever else out there is on. I love this whole, you know, the future of um, of controllability and expression is is something that i'm really big on so um you know when you mentioned before about the laser heart how it got and and you saw it, um a lot of those sort of movement controllers at nam i actually i'm very big on that because i think a lot of us musicians need to get off our butts don't we <laughs> and, and and actually you know use a bit more physical sort of um, you know, performance, but instead of just pro sitting on our chairs and programming sequences, you know, we need to get out and um, I think it's good, definitely good. Um, and I can and I can go all the way back to, th you know, thinking of uh, artists like Laurie Anderson who had uh, MIDI controlled sure. tyres and uh, obviously Jean-Michel Jarre with his, his famous laser heart, which I think originally was actually um, CV controlled, I believe, at the start, but he, he then went across to MIDI later. Um, yeah, and you yeah, know. it's incredible. Yeah, you know, Yamaha always does, we're a very conservative co company, and then we'll do something like the the Tenorion or the Miburi. Yeah. And I don't know <laughs> if you remember the Miburi, but it was a suit 
uh, back, and this was back in 1989 yeah. or something. You know, it was a long time ago, but it was a suit that you could wear and you could control FM synthesis with it. Um, you know, so I, I think one of the things we've been talking about is we probably do need a profile for gestural control of MIDI so that if you do this or this or this, it has a specific meaning as a MIDI command. Uh, you know, that's the, those are some of the exciting things that we want to do is, is it's great to have innovation, but if things together, then that's a very frustrating experience for, for the, for the users. And you don't want to have to learn how to use, you, you know, your, um, your Mimu glove, uh, and then have to learn how to use your Enhance Ear ring and then have to learn how to use your Genki wave ring. And they're all they're all doing exactly the same thing in different ways. That's one of the things that MIDI 2.0 is going to is going to solve, in and that you'll be able to use the same gesture. The technology may be very fundamentally different. Of course, what you're controlling in terms of of, of the uh, sound engine could be completely different, but the MIDI commands, uh, you know, are all similar. Uh, and the same thing we've been talking about a profile for just you know, these are things that I think should be done, a, a profile for Alexa, yeah. for voice com voice yeah. control of MIDI. You yeah. certainly don't want to have every company going out and figuring out, you know, to say split keyboard and you have to, and the, 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 the terminology is different for every manufacturer. That's exactly the problem that MIDI tries to solve. It's interoperability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you know, there are other sort of DIY projects. Like I've got one going. I, I mentioned it last week, um, which is my little um, Arduino project. And you can see with the um, MIDI DIN on the right and the OLED display just sort of left to that. Um, and you can see it's a, a USB shield on top of an Arduino Uno. Um, and these things are just very, very inexpensive to buy. And you can just get yourself immersed, plug it into your key computer and uh, Put a bit of code there's a lot of open source code out there and you can get them to work um so you know these things they kind of they're really easy to put together you don't need to solder and you can see i'm just using a little breadboard which i bought from a local electronics store um and those little pin cables you can buy packets of them for like a, a dollar you know so if you are interested you know you could go from something small like that to what that guy did before with the laser hub um you know it's pretty cool yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. This is uh, this is a, I guess, a little bit of a secret, but uh, I'm, I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, the first prototype that Yamaha did uh, back in 2015, Yamaha started, uh, you know, this project called uh, Future MIDI Expansions, which became MIDI 2.0. And the first thing that we built was we built an Arduino board. Uh, and we used the, the, the core idea of MIDI CI to communicate between two devices that had five pin DIN on them, and they would negotiate to a faster speed over five pin DIN. It had been done before. The electron had, had was a, a mm. device that two, take two electrons and you could flip a switch and it would run 10 times MIDI. You know, um, with a, a minor change, uh, you know, of about two cents to the part that's that's on a five pin DIN, you can get much much faster MIDI. And so the first prototype that we did of what is now MIDI 2.0 uh, was actually done on an Arduino board. Fantastic! That's really nice to know. It'd be actually pretty cool if we could get some photos of that too. Like to see uh, if you could dig them up. I found you know, that'd be awesome. You know, we could show you know this is even what big companies do and it, that'll inspire people but that sort of stuff inspires people i definitely think um but yeah um andrew so next off the bat is uh, do you want to talk about the looper next is that where you want to want to go because that was pretty exciting i was actually i was actually going to say uh yeah we can talk about loopers just very briefly but i actually would like to do long not for this episode is actually and i we're trying to get some stuff going and it's failed dismally today. Uh, <laughs> it's an actual episode on MIDI loopers versus sequences because I think yeah. there's actually a bit more of a topic there. A big topic, um, yeah. But I was just going, yeah, there's going to be a big topic there. So I just thought, look, um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of briefly run through 
is just some of the news that's come out of um, uh, Super Booth because that's been the you know uh, everyone's the stay at home let's do Super Booth at home mainly Super Booth's been predominantly um, uh, you know a lot of modular stuff a lot of full side of things but there's been a couple of interesting uh, MIDI projects um, they probably the the ones that um, uh, where are we at I'm gonna see if I can do this now oh look at that a technology I, let me just I make know. your screen so uh, hang on let me just make your screen yeah, so my, I can get rid of that other thing there you go Jeez. Get rid of the, we get rid of all the bits and pieces so um you know the the beauty about um uh, you know this the, the retro kits came out i actually have mm -hmm. one of those and i eventually would like to do a proper video on it alone it's a very interesting they've obviously been doing a bit of promotion with it at super booth um it's an interesting device as far as really good for those little setups you've got when uh you've got lots of gear to hook in um it does some interesting things. Uh, there's probably a few. I think there's a few firmware updates yet to happen. So, um, like one of the things that I've noticed is that I can get certain devices to crash it uh, if I'm not careful on the MIDI host side of it. Um, and the other thing I found was um, it doesn't like uh, MIDI devices that when it uses a USB host it doesn't like MIDI devices that. Um, announce more than one MIDI port. So for example, I've got a MIDI hub. The first channel on the MIDI hub will work, but the subsequent channels won't. And unfortunately, my montage won't work on it either, um, even though they're all both class compliant. So there's probably some work there on that. Uh, so I just right. wanted to briefly touch on that as far as, you know, that's sort of now been announced. Um, well, before you, before, you, sort of announced or not. before you run off, yep. just, just stay on that. Um, if you can go back to the other one. The, yeah. Yeah. So um, what I might do is I might actually get Grit from Retro Kits to come on because um, I actually yeah. know him. And uh, so I have been chatting to him. Now, um, obviously, the time that we're doing this show may be a challenge for him. So we're just trying to see if we can work out another way of doing it. But um, definitely yeah. let's, let's put a, a pin in for next week. We can definitely get uh, Grit yeah. involved because he's... Uh, obviously, he's been very busy with the, you know, the um, you call it super booth from home sort of show, and he's been extremely busy with that. But next week should be cleared up, and uh, he's really, really keen to you know to come on and, and talk about it. So uh, I just thought I'd mention that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, keep going. It's yeah. Uh, so the other one that's probably come out that uh, is a bit of news is the uh, I'll increase the size of that probably not the best of pictures is the and this is where we were talking about the midi loopers before so i'm going to come back a little bit more and mm -hmm. i think you know not that i have access to this device but it, it, you know i think there's a, there's a really interesting topic about that and it's just a very very simple uh a way of using a looper in the same way that people have looper pedals mm -hmm. in, in you know they have you know for guitars and so forth like that so i think that that's got some interest as well as been that um, and probably the other thing that's really kind of come out a little bit um, is yeah. this uh, MIDI controller that's just for the Jupiter Rate plugins. So I'm not sure if I would buy a separate unit for this myself, but um, someone will. You know, so it's it again. It, I've it just just as interesting. There hasn't been other than that. I think there's been a few announcements from uh, Novation with the SL Mark III updates. Uh, but generally, that's probably. I'll go back to me now. I think that that's that's the actual um, sort of the main MIDI news that has come out of Super Booth. So I just wanted to touch on those if people have got any questions or they want us to try and find out some more information. I. I think a uh, hardware controller for a soft synth is awesome. <laughs> I mean, a hardware controller for a soft synth, it, it's like great. What a great idea. I love it. Yeah, it's it's kind of... Um, we, do you remember Omnisphere? I think last year they, they did this massive update to their, um, their, their software where they went out and mapped, you know, like some of the major synths, you know, like Roland System A, there was the montage, there's... Um, 
you know, some of the Dave Smith instruments or now sequential gear, and you literally plugged the synths in uh, either USB or MIDI, and uh, Omnisphere would then sort of take on the persona of that hardware. Um, and it's kind of, I, I, I think this is kind of a thing, you know, where a lot of people do whinge about software and VST synths being, um, you know, that, that sort of clinical thing where they, they just don't like just clicking on a mouse and working on a flat screen. They like the tactile ability to sort of fiddle with knobs and sliders and, you know, that sort of stuff. And I think having controllers is, is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah, but, but actually, you know, what I'd like to bring up there is um, both uh, Spectrasonics, which, which is the company that owns Omnisphere, Spectrasonics and Audio Modeling were both working on very similar projects. And what, uh, what they were doing is they had to reproduce all of those things in SysX. Wow. So, they, so for every single device, they had to get the SysX implementation and then they had to implement it. When we first showed the concept of profiles, and uh, some of the work that uh, Andrew is doing with Property Exchange to both audio modeling and Spectrasonics, they went, oh, well, that's the right way to do it. <laughs> yeah. because, the, because what you can do is you, you can create a profile, which is a profile is a generalized expression of a, of, of, for a particular use case. The, the, the example we always use is drawbar organs because everybody knows what a drawbar organ is it's got nine drawbars it's you know it's it, it's got a the switch for the leslie and all of that stuff and so you can create a, a, a profile that is an, an analogy for that what what um the work that we're doing in prop property exchange allows you to go even further and get very very detailed about describing that device a uh, base on schema so eventually you will be able to to do the kinds of things that these companies are now having to do on a case-by-case -case basis, you will have a platform that will allow the machines to talk to each other and generate, uh, you know, graphic user, user interfaces to uh, um, set up the controllers in a device to map to the software synth automatically. I, it's going to, I don't think people have quite understood every, how, really good the world is going to be in a few years <laughs> for them uh <laughs> we are going to make it incredibly transparent um you know you are going to plug your devices in they will talk to each other and they will work and you know hopefully we will get to the point where you will never have to you know d dig out that manual and figure out what cc message needs to be connected to what you know device all of that will be taken care of by the machines communicating with each other and self configuring. Yeah, it was, it was, that was definitely something that I, um, I, I was aware of as well. Cause I mean, obviously Andrew is, is involved in the property exchange side of things. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm actually pretty keen on getting myself involved in, you know, beta test or whatever you want to call it, beta testing. So, um, there's something that I'll definitely, um, I mean, I don't know if you know, um, Adam, but I'm actually reasonably comfortable with, you know, things like SysX and MIDI and understanding the technologies. Um, so, you know, that side of things um, I'm pretty big on. And the other side that I'm pretty big on too is is uh, spreading the word and educating as well. So I think one of the things that I think is really a big thing to do is to try and demystify um, some of these things for people so that they can get back to my, my, my saying is get back to using, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I hear musicians say to me is that, oh, I don't have time for setting up. I don't have time for tweaking and, you know, all the back end stuff. I just want to get back to writing music and, um, and that sort of thing's big for me. So yeah, whatever we can do to help that, I think is a big thing. Yeah. Well, we have a, I have a, I've, been involved with synthesizer design for many, many years. I was the product planning manager for Korg Inc. when we designed the Korg M1. And uh, when we were doing that, I, I came up with a phrase that I always use, which is making it easy is really hard. And uh, so the engineers have to work very hard to create the protocols and the specifications 
that make it incredibly easy and incredibly transparent for the end user because when you're writing a song, the last thing you want to do is have to switch your brain. I had a really interesting conversation with Alan Parsons. I was doing a, um, uh, an, an interview with him, and we got into a conversation about left brain and right brain. And what he said is the really, the really great producers are able to go between their left brain and their right brain yeah. without thinking about it. But most people get really stuck. <laughs> And so what happens is, you know, they're in that creative mode, but then they have to switch and they have to put on this technical hat. And when they put on the technical hat, the musician's hat goes away and they completely lose yeah. their creative you capability. It. It's just, yeah. you know, and that, that is so, so important to, to keep that creative flow. So nothing impedes you from just, you know, sitting and writing that song. Yeah. I think the other good thing too is each time we do one of these shows, we're going to keep getting people with questions, and and I like the fact that you know even though it's still not really officially out there, um, it's good to sort of answer them as they come. So we've got one here um, from one of our chatties below, and there's a question. I'm a, from Wagu. I'm a bit worried that any new hardware that supports uh, MIDI 2.0 is going to go immediately drop to 1.0 DINs, and uh, you know. He also went on to say, it doesn't actually show it there, but I don't know if there'll be a simple handy dongle or converter box aside from computers or a Raspberry Pi. So it's that's a pretty good question. Um, does Do any yeah. of you guys want to handle that one? <laughs> I, I, I'll take that one, of course. Andrew's sure. going, don't, don't ask me. Um, so, you know, I think that's the really, really the most important thing about MIDI 2.0. And this is really, I have to credit uh, Mike Kent, uh, who worked for Roland for many, many years. And then when he left Roland, uh, Yamaha hired as a, as a consultant. And he's been working for us as lo along with Andrew, uh, full disclosure. They both you know, are working as consultants for Yamaha. Um, Mike came up with this idea, and, it, and it, it's a very simple idea, which is the one thing that we absolutely needed was backwards compatibility. And so um, the way that MIDI CI works is it's, it, I, I do this you know, all the time. It, I explain it this way. The first question that comes out from MIDI CI is, are you new? And if it gets no answer, it knows that it's not talking to a new device. And it just falls back to MIDI 1.0. And so all of your MIDI 1.0 gear will continue to work in, in the uh, MIDI setup. And MIDI 2.0 allows us to discover new capabilities and then de determine what capabilities that device can do. But it will always work with MIDI 1.0 devices. And so in, built into the MIDI 2.0 specification is all of the, the, the mathematics, all of the stuff to convert from 32-bit controllers back to 7-bit controllers. All of that stuff was done very intentionally to keep backward compatibility. So yeah. first of all, you will never have, nobody has to buy a new cable. Uh, you, you, pro you will not have to buy any kind of new interface box. Um, the, we, um, the USB 2.0 MIDI specification is being worked on right now. It's almost complete. Um, it, it is, the design is already done. And one of the key parts about that design was that it had to be completely seamless so that if you had a MIDI 1.0 device and you plugged it in, it would work. If you had a MIDI 2.0 device and you plugged it in, it would work. And how that rolls out in terms of how it works in the operating systems, every operating system will be slightly different. Um, I believe that actually this is an opportunity for all the operating system companies. Uh, first of all, you know, some of the uh, um, s some of them will handle it the way they have always handled it. You know, Apple has a central MIDI server, and they will handle all of that uh, communication and translation. They will do that. So, you know, when you plug it, plug, plug into a Macintosh, it will simply work. Google uh, and Android actually works very similarly because they don't really don't care. They 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 put messages in a pipe, and the pipe doesn't. It doesn't matter whether it's MIDI one or MIDI two. Um, 
one of the interesting things is I believe that uh, eventually the work for MIDI 2.0 will really improve things on the Windows platform. And the reason for that is, is that this was an opportunity for um, Microsoft to go in and they, they're going to go in and they're going to update uh, MIDI. And they've done a really good job in the past two or three years in terms of, of improving the way that MIDI worked and doing more stuff. But this is going to give them a real opportunity and a real initiative to do that. And all of those improvements that are being made will be improvements that will help with MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0. Because MIDI 2.0 is just more MIDI. <laughs> Yeah. It's it's not a different thing. It's not a different. It's it's more expression, more channels, um, um, more uh, resolution in the controllers. But if you look at it, you'll 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 look at it and you'll go, okay, that's a note on. Oh, okay, it's got some more stuff in it, but it's a note on and it's a note off. So it will be very 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 familiar to people and also they will not have to go out and you're not you know the last thing that anybody wanted was to force anyone to have to replace their gear that was not we yeah. knew that that was just not acceptable i mean we did a lot of surveys we we didn't go off blindly and 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 you know just let engineers you know do stuff uh, without getting input from the people who use MIDI. We did a survey of about 4,000 people uh, about two and a half years ago and got some very, very detailed feedback on what was acceptable, what wasn't acceptable, what they wanted. And the things they wanted were more expression, uh, more resolution, uh, more channels, better timing. I mean, mm. th th those were the, those were the four, four things. Uh, and the important thing, again, you, you know, this is a great example. In the MIDI 2.0 specification, there's a thing called jitter timestamps. Yeah. Well, jitter timestamps, you know, you can send those to a MIDI 1.0 device. It doesn't have to be MIDI 2.0 protocol compatible. It doesn't have to use the higher resolution. Again, what we tried to do is improve MIDI. Mm. And, and so, yes, MIDI 2.0 has a lot of great things and MIDI 2.0 protocol, as you can see up here, you know, there's there, MIDI 2.0 is this big thing and, and really MIDI 2.0 protocol is just a small portion of that. Yeah. Of the, this entire suite of things that, it, that encapsulates all of that bi-directional MIDI CI based uh, MIDI 2.0 suite of new things for MIDI. Yeah, actually, you you raised a a, a a point that I was actually going to ask you about, um, and that is uh, for me one of the big um, parts of me that I I kind of um, I like to sort of get technical and investigate is MIDI clock, and uh, it tends to be a pretty uh, pretty contentious issue with a lot of people, um, and it's not necessarily to do with MIDI and MIDI protocol itself. It's some in some situations, it's got a lot to do with the hardware or the setup, or there's a lot of other players involved. Oh, the, you know. the operating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, one of the things that um, I, I mean, I, why we've got you, Evan, is to get you to talk about how the MIDI 2.0 um, is addressing some of the MIDI clock issues. Um, just so, you know, out, out of interest, I guess. Is is that something that you could talk about just briefly? Uh, sh sure. Um, so, you know, we, we, we did want to address that. Um, we, we made a decision that we, uh, so let me prep saying that we adopted five core specifications for MIDI 2.0 in February. Uh, but the other thing that we did was we opened out, MIDI 1.0 had, was simply full. There were, there were no opcodes, there were no new messages that could be created in MIDI 1.0. One, one of the last things that was, was done was a, a, an a, adoption for high resolution velocity. It was actually pushed by Yamaha because we have high resolution velocity in our, our disc levers. But it was a very kludgy thing of taking two CC messages and sticking them together. It was not the right way to approach in a general sense, but but th there were simply no more messages available. Uh, so one of the things that happens with MIDI 2.0 is it it opens out literally the next four decades 
of potential improvements to MIDI. Uh, and that's, that's the first point. We made a very conscious decision uh, that in the first uh, iteration of MIDI 2.0, we were not going to touch system messages at all. Okay, so so MIDI 1.0 system messages and MIDI 2.0 system messages are the same. What we did do uh, is we added something called a, a jitter timestamp, and a, and so there, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be brave and dive into it. But there are two problems with timing. Um, latency is one problem. Um, and, and that can be caused by a lot of different things. But the worst problem actually for musicians is jitter. And jitter is when the time is inconsistent. Yep. It, it, it becomes sloppy. And musicians are very, very sensitive to jitter because it th completely throws them off. So what we did is we, we, we created a, a, a feedback loop between two devices so that they can, they can timestamp messages and send it out. And then the receiver of that message can look at that timestamp and move the, their own timing in regards to the messages that they're receiving because they, they get some indication of that. That's, that's a first step. Um, eventually, um, I'm sure that, you know, one of the things we're already starting to talk about is we need to have a, a solution for networked MIDI. Mm -hmm. And networked MIDI will mean you know, that is a, that's a big project because that means true synchronization across the network. I mean, that's a gigantic undertaking. Uh, we will probably, you know, use some technology that is already available. For example, the, what used to be called AVB or time-sensitive networks, you know, something that has already been established uh, by uh, other industries uh, that will probably serve as the basis for what we do. But that's in that's that total you know, network solution over the internet, that is, was something that we just tackle in this, in this first iteration, because quite frankly, it's going to take, you know, everybody a while to absorb all of the, the change that we've already adopted. Uh, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, I would expect that we are, we've already seen Roland release a MIDI 2.0 ready keyboard, um, I can't tell you what they are or when they will be released, but I know that there are any number of MMA companies who are working on MIDI 2.0 uh, firmware upgrades for devices that already exist in the marketplace. Because again, you don't necessarily need to have even a new USB driver uh, or the, the MIDI 2.0 protocol to do things like property exchange and uh, profile. So, you know, you, we're going to see the rollout of, of new MIDI 2.0 devices in, in, in the coming 12 months. Uh, we, will, we will see, you know, a USB driver that will be adopted and that will, that will spur further adoption. All of these things are, you know, very much in the works. And yet we, we've already, uh, you know, we have already decided that there are things that we need to do. I mean, we need to have a standard MIDI file 2 file format. Mm -hmm. Right, you, you can't you can't put MIDI two messages in a, in, a, in a standard MIDI file because it's yeah. not standard MIDI anymore. You know, yeah. Um, so we have a whole roadmap of things that we're working on, and, and that's kind of the exciting part about it is that as opposed to uh, somebody somebody was quoting Churchill and saying, you know, th this this is not the end. Uh, it's it's not. It's not even uh, the 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 end of the beginning, but it might be the beginning of the end, or something like that. I I totally blew that blew that quote, but it's basically <laughs> saying that you know we really just started yeah. uh, this first introduction. It really you know lays it out for the next forty years of of potential innovation. Yeah, and I think the other thing to sort of to bring out on that is that it's something for us to get excited about because we know that you know MIDI clock is is a bugbear with a lot of musicians. Like the jitter is is definitely the one that I I I find frustrating. And I mean I actually do lots of videos on my channel where I, I actually have 
some sort of MIDI clock measuring measuring display it's showing how the jitter, even in parts of seconds, you know, it will actually just vary. And you can hear it with things like MIDI controlled delay pedals and stuff like that. You get kind of a rubber band sound when it jitters. And it's yep. actually, in some cases, actually, it's a cool thing. In other cases, it's a very frustrating thing. So, you know, depending on how, how you want to look at it. But um, it'll be nice to, to know that um, because of the higher resolution and, and, the, and you said with the, the timing messages that I've sent out, that, that's kind of going to help. Um, so that's really cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll say one other thing that we discovered because it is, you know, the USB is more than fast enough. USB 1 was more than fast enough for MIDI. Mm. Yeah, and and USB two and three are, are faster, right? But but the, we discovered a problem, and this this is one of the things that you know you discover as you as you investigate new things. We found that uh, I want to explain this the right way. So uh, when you connect a USB device to uh, you know a USB uh, controller keyboard via USB to a host computer. That's not, and and USB will be as fast as USB is, and it's way fast enough to do MIDI. What we found was that there were a lot of applications that couldn't determine when they were sending out from the computer. They couldn't determine whether what was on the end, the eventual receiver of that MIDI signal was a USB device or a five pin DIN device. Mm. Yeah. And so what they did is they throttled everything that came out of the computer to 31.25 and sent it on a USB transport. I mean, that, that would be like being on the Audubon and going three miles an hour, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, you know, the transport had the capability to be very fast but the computer made the decision is like, well, we don't know if the thing that's getting that is only going to be able to take 31.25. Yeah. In the process of doing all the things that we're doing with MIDI 2.0, we, we believe that we will, will be able to ad address that and so that uh, applications won't have to do that anymore. So again, that's an example of where, you know, your regular old USB device that, that, uh, is is not necessarily updated um you know to do anything new will all of a sudden work better yeah yeah because of we're we're in infra infra infrastructural changes in terms of the way the os works yeah actually i'm glad you mentioned that because i was talking to andrew about that that point actually last time because there was someone in i can't remember who it was in the chat saying will din midi din become you know, sort of redundant, and uh, and I said, well, you know, from an an engineering point of view, um, technically the DIN, the, the actual wires and everything on the DIN isn't the problem. It's the controller, like you said, uh, and then with the the you know the controlling of the throughput and and that side of it on the MIDI one point spec. Because if you did let things go too fast through that transport mechanism, you'll have things like messages being dropped off. And we all come across that when we're doing things like firmware updates and you're using SysX and you have to go into your MIDI aux or SysX librarian if you're on a Mac and you have to slow it right down so that the you know the device it doesn't get the MIDI messages too fast because we're all using USBs, right? So yeah, it's really it's really cool that you mentioned that. I like that. Um, so where, where are we at now, Andrew, with everything else? Have we got um, any other topics that we need to address? I I think we've kind of covered everything. Uh, I'm just going to say, Athan, if you wanted to do any kind of last minute, um, is there any is there any MIDI news that we're allowed to say? And I was also going to ask <laughs> if there was. We're also going to ask if there's any um, uh, any events with the with the MIDI month that we should let people know. Uh, sure. So, I mean, really, uh, you know, it, it's it's pretty simple. Just go to, um, you know, uh, midi.org uh, is, is where all the information is there. Uh, I was working today. I can tell you uh, we are planning on doing four webinars. Um, I believe the first one will be what I was working on today, which was actually it was a lot of fun. Um, I've been good friends with uh, 
Michelle Mukusa from the Bob Moog Foundation for, for a number of years. Um, I'm on their advisory panel. And she arranged to get us a bunch of material about uh, on synthesis uh, mm -hmm. that was on the, on the Bob Moog Foundation website. So there's, there's these great graphics. And so I was putting to an article together today on synthesis. It's my, my love. Synthesis and MIDI, like, you know, yeah, just somehow yeah. go together. Awesome. Um, and and so it's it's this big article. We're going to do a webinar, and we're going to kick th that off. That will be one thing. Uh, we are all, the second webinar will will be about collaboration tools. Uh, there's a whole bunch of collaboration tools. Uh, there's a whole bunch of free downloads for soft synths. Uh, there, we're going to be talking about things like BandLab, all of the the web MIDI based DAWs. I'm not sure how familiar people are with things. Uh, like uh, Soundtrap uh, and uh, you know Bandcamp, there's a, a number of those. Zen Beats actually was came the, from Roland came out of a, a company that was 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 doing that uh, sort of stuff. So web web MIDI based uh, um, application synthesizers, DAWs, and th things for people to collaborate with on the web. And then the uh, third webinar will be one specifically for developers on MIDI 2.0 where we'll get all of the really geeky people together and we'll talk about packets. Oh yeah, it's quite exciting. <laughs> um, and, and then the final one will be uh, something headed up by uh, uh, Craig Anderton, um, who I think everybody should probably know. He's, he's one of the uh, most well-known technology writers uh, in the past 20, 30 years, he will be heading something up uh, and it will be a webinar on MIDI 2.0 for musicians, what it's going to mean to them. Uh, I think we'll be, you know, diving in a little bit depth in terms of what you can expect in the next 12 months, two years, three years. If I could predict what would happen, at, you know, four or five years out, uh, I wouldn't be sitting in this two-bedroom apartment in Elisa Viejo. I'd, I'd, I'd be on a, a private beach somewhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. That's awesome. So, I mean, that's some really, really cool topics. Like for me, um, and then I'm, I'm exactly in the same boat as you. I love synthesis. Um, and it's awesome how you've got um, involved with the, the Bob Moog Foundation. Um, obviously, you know, we, we all know Mark Doty used to be um, – a member of that he used to work there and now he's gone off to Buchla now um, and we all love his you know in-depth knowledge and he talks about synthesis so so coherently um, so we can all learn from you know the Bob Moog Foundation they've got some really really good information I also loved how you mentioned about the collaboration side of stuff we did a, a live stream we do a Saturday show as well where we um, it's a bit more sort of joking and fun but we, we talk about certain topics and one of our topics a couple of weeks ago was collaboration online collaboration uh the band lab one was was mentioned um and obviously the biggest issue that a lot of people have got is how do we get everyone in sync so you know that obviously will be very um very interesting to see what you guys come up with there so yeah very very interesting so that's that's all part of the may is midi month um i'm guessing so um you know so yep. everyone if they want to sort of follow that they, they register at media.org um is there going to be um that's going to be the central part where everything's going to be sort of communicated from or is there going to be a facebook page a youtube channel anything like that or just mate just media.org yeah yeah pretty pretty much all of the above we we focus most of the stuff uh, right on media.org and if you sign up um you know we typically send out one newsletter a month we don't you know we don't uh, we're not selling anything to anyone, so we we yeah. don't bother you with tremendous amount. Uh, it, during May is mini month. Send out four newsletters, uh, and so you know if you, you sub, then you'll you'll get the next you'll get the information next webinar that's coming up. I am going to be spending the entire weekend redoing the um, uh, midi dot org website and uh, getting it all ready for May is mini month. Sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, um, Evan, for being part of uh, Midi, Midi Week. And at the moment, uh, Andrew and I, uh, we, you know, we've done two shows um, and we plan on continuing this um, because um, there's so much to talk about in this and we'll keep keep it to a, you know, un, 
an hour-ish or under an hour. I mean, I think originally we wanted to do it as half an hour. It's just too hard. It's just because there's just so many things to talk <laughs> about each week. So, um, you know, if there's anything that you would like us to cover, um, by all means, send it our way and we'll definitely, um, um, you know, share it. And also you're more than welcome to come on, on again as, any, as many times as you like. So um, maybe a good opportunity to pop in sometime during May as well to keep that sort of the word out for everybody. So it's been awesome having you. Um, of course, Andrew, it's been Thank awesome you. having you as well. Um, so Thank I you. think we'll probably end it here. I think the, the questions that we got from the chatties were pretty much uh, mostly answered. A lot of people were sort of just nodding their heads and agreeing with everything that we were talking about. So that sounds pretty good. Um, obviously, a lot of questions will come later when they watch this on the replay. So um, feel free to, you know, Chuck your questions in the comments below if you are watching us on the replay. It's been awesome. Um, yeah. Brent, anyway. if you want to, you know, if you get questions from people and you want to send them to me, I'm happy to, you know, uh, shoot you back something so that you can, uh, if I'm not able to, you know, join, uh, uh, you, you can go, I got this message, here's the answer. So we want to we want to provide all of the answers we, you know, we when, when we can. Some things we can't, you know, obviously we can't discuss, you know, when, uh, major OS companies are going to release anything. Uh, you know that just we that just we have good relationships with Google, Microsoft, and Apple, and we would like to keep it that way. So we have to. You mm. know, there's certain things we can't discuss, uh, but a lot of things we actually. You know, we're, we like to be pretty open about what we're working on, and if people have questions or suggestions, or want to get involved. Uh, you know, go to go to midi.org and and uh, you know join join the club. Yeah, absolutely. I thoroughly recommend it. I've been a, a member since probably the early days, since it first let us be members, um, which is awesome. So awesome. Uh, anything parting messages from Andrew? Or are you are you good to go? No. Look, other than uh, thank you, Athan, for for joining us. I really appreciate you spending the time with us today. That's been really good. Yes. Uh, I'll echo that. Absolutely. It's been very, very informative. So on that note, um, waving goodbye to everybody. Thanks for joining us in the chat. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks time for another episode of Midweek Midi. Thanks. Mid I can't even say it now. Midweek Midi. <laughs> see you later.